The following production is part of the Play Some Video Games podcast network. Shapes and welcome to Board with Video Games, the gaming podcast that strives for the right balance of coverage for games you play on your table and on your television. You can think of us as the peaches and cream of gaming podcasts. We're a proud member of the PSVG Podcast Network. I am one of your hosts, Kyle, and joining me on this co-op adventure, the only person sweeter than a Georgia peach. Josh, how are you doing this evening? Uh, well, I'm, I'm uncomfortable now, <laughs> but before I was just fine. <laughs> I paid you a compliment. Why are you uncomfortable? I don't know if I've ever been uh, called sweeter than a Georgia peach. And all that makes me think of is like serial killer movies. What? <laughs> like <laughs> Silence <laughs> of the Lambs. <laughs> I don't know if there's a reference to Georgia peaches in Silence of the Lambs. Yeah, I'm trying to I'm... figure out where the Silence of the Lamb peach crossover What's the comes movie in. movie where they say I could eat a peach for days? Oh, I don't know off the top of my head. But it's not like super creepy. I okay. Think it's a movie like that. <laughs> So, well, well, a, a listener will let us know, I'm sure. Yes. I will strike that from future things to call you. I will no longer call you sweeter than a Georgia peach. Okay. But hey, <laughs> with all the talk of Georgia, you may have heard that mysterious third voice. And we would be doing a disservice to the entire state if we did not have one of their own on the podcast. And with that, I welcome Nintendo enthusiast and proud papa of PSVG, Donnie Reese. How are you doing, sir? Doing well. Greetings, Koopalings. Happy to make my way over here. Josh, the movie you're looking for is Face Off. Not even closely remoted at all related (laughs) Silence of the Lambs. Not even close. Yeah, you're right. (laughs) So that was a good Face Off was a solid movie, right? Face Off is better than Speed. (laughs) (laughs) That bar bar is pretty low at this point. I feel like based off all the movies we have thrown into that basket that are better than Speed. Hashtag better than Speed. Shout out to better than Speed on, on Twitter. Yeah, who would have thought there was a Better Than Speed podcast when we started that joke? (laughs) So anyway, hey, this is not a a movie podcast or a podcast about speed, but apparently that does exist. This is a gaming podcast. So thanks so much for joining us this week. As always, send any feedback, questions, or suggested topics to at BoardWithVG on Twitter. Also check out all the awesome stuff Josh posts over on the Instagram. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash BoardWithVG. And still waiting for that first fan fiction at via email board with vg at gmail.com and as always use that hashtag board with vg so that we can follow all the wonderful things you're doing on the social medias we're really excited to have donnie here but we're going to run through a couple of the usual things first so josh why don't you talk a little bit about what you've been playing on your tabletop that sounds good i want to preface my my games by telling you we cleaned off our front porch over the on saturday so you it's played your a, games on your front porch? So we played our games on the front porch. It's been a mess for years. We finally got it cleaned up, thrown in a dumpster, all that kind of stuff. So we set up our table out on the front porch. The house, you know, I would say like 10, 12 years ago, the house started settling uh, not super great. And they replaced our first floor porch. And ours is the second floor. So we're sitting out and I put my table down and we set up our first game and it you can't uh, you roll a die and it rolls right down the other <laughs> side of the table so it is extremely slanted <laughs> and impossible to play games on so is it i was gonna say is it better or worse than playing them on your floor oh uh, well on a nice like summer spring summer day it's better but it just can't be a die game no dice allowed it has to be something that that will not affect it at all because it was it was interesting uh so yeah so we played two games for the first time um machi koro which i think is shocking probably to people who know me and shocking to me that i haven't played it before i'm Um, surprised i've had it for for a while but i we just never got to playing it and onitama which is a game that i really wanted to play uh, so I'll talk about Machi Koro 
it's pretty easy, pretty easy to learn game and pretty, well, I shouldn't say it's pretty easy. It's easy to learn and probably hard to master. And we only played it two people. So I can imagine it being chaotic with four, the way that the game runs. Um, but a while back, I bought a play mat when I bought one of the expansions from, uh, I think, a miniature market sale. Uh, and essentially what Machi Koro is, is uh, like a like a town building game, so to speak. You have these um, cards in your hand that each player have. You start with the same cards. And your goal is to build your four structures before the other players. Um, and each of these structures has different abilities. So one of them is... Uh, if you do, I think it's a train station. If you build the train station first, you get to roll two die instead of one. And the reason why you're rolling die is you have a board set up and it ranges from one to 13, I want to say. And I could be wrong, but essentially uh, each number on a die represents a building in a city. And each city gives you a power while you're playing. So... Um, if you roll a one, that's a wheat field. And if you have a wheat field, um, the way it works is every time a one is rolled, you gain a coin. So that's if you roll a one or your opponent rolls a one. And these are stackable cards. So you can buy multiple wheat fields. So every time a one is rolled, you can get a multiple of that. There's That's a blue card. So the green cards, if you roll the number on the green card, you have to roll it on your turn to get the benefit of that card. So uh, whatever the building might be, it would say two. If you roll a two on your turn only, you gain one, two, three coins, whatever the co whatever the coin count is. There are red buildings, which uh, basically punish you, your opponent if they roll that die. So the cafe is number three. And if my wife had a cafe and I roll a number three, I have to pay her a coin. Just call them what they are. They're the jerk buildings. You take them if you're a jerk. Well, you take them to win, yes. So you <laughs> took them. I see how this goes. Continue sometimes on. you have to be a jerk to win. Uh, you also have purple buildings, which are sixes. And those also are similar to the reds, where they usually cause um, your opponent to give you money or, or to lose a building or something like that. The four buildings you have, they cost coins to build. And you can build them in any order. So I think they cost, they go six coins, ten coins, 16 coins and 22 coins. I could be wrong, but it's right around that. Um, when the game ends, once someone builds all four of their buildings, um, it was fun. It was quick. If you know Flip City, it's very similar to Flip City. Um, but instead of flipping cards, you're rolling the die for them. Um, I think it would be really good for families, like a nice introductory game. And there's a bunch of expansions. I actually just picked one up at Target on clearance for eight bucks. Um, the Target exclusive um, Big City Lights or something like that. Bright Lights Big City. Yes. And then I also have two other expansions that will add into the game. The base box does have a lot of space to add cards to. So I think I think I can put them all into one box, which is nice to see in a board game. Um, and only time I'll talk about real quick. Um, it's an abstract, similar. It's very like much like chess in a way. If you look at the pictures on, on Instagram, you'll see. Um, but what, I thought it was really cool, and I can't wait to play it again. Uh, it's a two-player game only. You take a blue or a red. Someone represents blue, someone represents red. Um, you have your emperor, which we'll call like the king. And then you have pawns. You have four pawns that line up next to him. When you open the, uh, the game, there's a deck of cards. You shuffle the cards, and you give two cards random to each player and they are literally your move cards they're named after a um an animal from uh, like martial arts culture and they have certain moves that you can only take on the card and they're laid out in a grid just like the board is um, and basically you're overtaking your opponent's pieces or you're trying to get your emperor to the throne on the other end of the board and after each player has two cards, you draw one card for the first player, and that goes um, to signify their first. And say I have the dragon and the ox. Those are two different types of moves. If I play the dragon, 
after I play it, I turn it 180 degrees and I slide it to the other end of the board and it will sit and wait for my opponent to take a move. And then they'll take that card after they play their card. So you're always getting different moves on your turn. And we only played with five cards is probably 20 in the base game. So there's so many different possibilities. In the first game we played, four of the cards were very similar. And one, the dragon, was very different where you would move further away. So whoever had that dragon card was kind of like a, a game changer because you have to pay attention to your opponent's card to see how they can move. Because a lot of times my myself or my wife moved to a, piece, a place on the board where we were just overtaken because we didn't look at the card our opponent had. Um, I really like it. I can't wait to play it again. Uh, game takes 15 minutes. Uh, and it's a $20 game. And the expansion is 13 bucks, I think. So really quick, uh, Bright Lights Big City, I'm yes. pretty certain is not a s- expansion for Machi Koro. I think it is a standalone game. Oh, uh-oh. <laughs> I think I could be wrong. And I was very confused by this the first time I saw it. And I was going to say this when you were saying it before, but you jumped right into Onitama. I believe it is like a best of where there are cards from the base games and the expansions in it. <laughs> Okay. So it is like eight bucks. Yeah. So it is like its own standalone version of the game. Uh, So just be aware. I I think that's how that works. Yeah. I'll check it out. But I will say, if you haven't played Machi Koro with the expansions yet, I think the game is far better with the expansions than it is as base, as just the base game. Because I do think there is a very simple strategy for winning the base game. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but I think there is one. Well, I I know that you are very proficient in card drafting games so (laughs) i might not be on your level of mastering but remember you're you're rolling a dice here so you have to go based off of what the dice says so you're it's not that's true you know you obviously there's still definitely engine and i think that's one of the things that i like about the expansions is it definitely increases the engine building possibilities so it's not just about kind of piecemealing these things together like there's a distinct strategy you can go for and really try to maximize hey i'm going to get more of x card because it syncs really well with y card and when that happens i get z benefit Uh, that happens much more when you have to add the expansions in okay cool um so that's it for me i was going to throw it to donnie but donnie is going to cover um his board game stuff when we talk later on on our topic actually i'm gonna throw you guys a curveball 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 pulling from uh ot I actually did play a video, uh, board game at Momocon. I completely forgot about it. It's a game that I actually own. I've been playing it for a while. Uh, Momocon had a really cool little section where they just had board games that you could check out and tons of tables. And like there were tons of families and friends and people would just come in and out and set up board games. So I don't know if that's common. It was my first con, um, but it was neat. And uh, my kids immediately saw that they had the Mario level up game, which we had bought at GameStop and we had played that. And uh, we were playing that while we waited for the exhibit floor to open. And that nice. is a pretty neat little game. Have you guys ever played it? No. I think it's much simpler than most of the games that I've heard you guys recommend to us before. Um, it's kind of, I don't know, it's kind of chance, kind of a, a bluff game. And essentially it's, um, it's got a really nice board um, that makes these stairs. There's these five levels. And you start the game by placing your characters on different levels. Like everybody gets to place one and by process of elimination, you fill up the board. And there's like some question blocks keeping with the Mario theme and every turn goes around and you get to move one character. And when a character makes it to the top of the ladder, um, they're crowned as champion, but then everybody has to vote and you've got uh, yes cards. You've got no cards. You've got no vote cards, like, or, like a veto. And then once we finally, by process of elimination, once you finally crown a champion collectively, then you start tallying up the scores. So ultimately as the loop of the game really is, you trying to bluff and hold your own characters back while everybody else runs out of cards or you blitzkrieg everybody else while everybody's waiting. You try to get up there and stack the deck early, right? So even if they vote, no, you put, you know, four of your five characters on the top, (laughs) on the top rung and you, and you, you know, just outscore them. Um, The blocks are fun because they make you swap with other characters. They make you lose a turn. They make you lose a card. They make somebody else vote first. So that type of stuff. So um, as you were talking, I was thinking, I was like, you know, I did play a board game uh, with my kids. And then (laughs) it's one they quite enjoy, probably just because of the IP and the way it's set up. It's very Super Mario Land-ish, right? With the grass and the blocks and all that. It looks cool. Yeah. 
Fairy does tale. it feel like Mario? Like when Not you play it, or it does okay? No, nope. I mean it. It only because like in, in Mario games they jump. So I guess you could think like by moving the character up a level like, and and hitting the blocks, it kind of in some sort of two D plane represents a jump. But I mean, no, it just feels like this game that has Mario characters on it. <laughs> uh, it could be anything else, I'd imagine. Okay. <laughs> Well, it's a bit disappointing, but I'm glad your family likes it. Like, that's really the my important kids thing love in it. the end. That's the my important son, thing. My son has it set up on his shelf like a display model. Like, he just has the game set up ready to go at all times. And he can just, nice. like, grab it and we can play it. So, cool. Very cool. So, my game is another actual simple game to explain. So, it's a, a group of simple games this week. And mine is Battleship, which is a two- to four-player abstract strategy game uh, published by Blue Orange And the instruction manual for Battleship is basically like a three by five business card that you can open and close. And that's the entire thing. It's four little pages of a little three by five card. And that is the entire instructions. What the game is, is you start with every player. You can play two to four players. And every player starts with four pasture tiles. And there's four basically spots on each pasture tile. And you go back and forth putting these pasture tiles out. So every time you are building, so you're always building the board before the game starts. So the more people, the more complex, more diverse board you might get. Then each player has a stack of 16 sheep tokens and you pick an edge piece to put those tokens on. Then all you do is you go around the table and you must move a pile of your sheep in a straight line until they can't move anymore. So you could move... 15, because you always have to leave at least one behind, but you can move 15 sheep one direction, you can move 8 sheep, and then you'd have two stacks of 8. But that's literally the entire game, is you're just moving your stack of sheep in a straight line as far as they can go. So you can never stop in the middle of something, you have to stop when you get to an edge, or when you get to another sheep, because you can never jump sheep. And the game ends when nobody can move anymore. Once no one has any legal moves, the game ends, and you count how many of your sheep are visible from the top of the board? So literally, you're just trying to figure out how am I going to move my sheep, try to cut off my opponent, and take up as many of the pasture spots as I can until we run out of space or I can no longer make legal moves. And if you plan ahead significantly, you can cut people off. I actually one time played a game of this. This wasn't this last weekend when I played it, but one time I tried to be really tricky with something and I actually got blocked right away at the very, very beginning of the game so I could only get four points total. That wasn't a very fun game, but it's a really enjoyable game. It's really easy to teach and it's really easy to pick up and play. But it is a game that on the surface, very straightforward, very simple to teach. But once you get going, especially since the board is different every time, since you're always building it before the game starts, there's actually a lot of depth to it and understanding the strategy of, is it good to move 15 of your sheep right off the bat? Is it better to move eight of them and then kind of take over that half and try to take over the half you're on? How is that all going to work? How does that work with empty spots? Because obviously, since you're building this board, sometimes you might end up with gaps in the board because, you know, people are just kind of laying these tiles they have to touch, but they don't necessarily have to touch every space. So you're going to end up with blank spots and empty spots. And it's actually a really fun little game. It's really inexpensive. Uh, The production quality is actually very high. The tokens for your sheep are really good quality. It's really colorful. Again, easy game to recommend if you're looking for a more simple abstract strategy game to get into. Like I said, the instructions are very straightforward, very easy to learn. And I think it's one of those things that, you know, even younger kids, meaning like seven or eight, could get into this game and understand how this game plays. So I think it's something that could be fit really well with families as well. So if you're looking for something simple and not super expensive, I definitely recommend Battle Sheep. Yes. So like Risk with Sheep? I, I mean, way less advanced than Risk, but kind of, picture. yes, kind of. You're picture like, taking over territories. Yeah, it's kind of like an area control, like trying to do that. And yeah, kind of, for sure. Nice. So with that, we'll move on to what we've been playing on our televisions. Josh, sir, what have you been playing on your television screen? It's so funny. I was like, I must have played a bunch of games. I don't know that I did. Um, <laughs> I don't know why I didn't play. I didn't get back into Detroit. I'm having a tough time, um, making myself go back to that for whatever reason. So I was going to ask, what, what, why do you think so? I'm having a tough time with the moral choices in the game. Mm. It's for me, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a very empathetic person. So when I'm put into a situation that is uncomfortable, that I would never want to be in. And in this game, 
were you kind of forced to make a decision that you don't even know it's the right decision to make, depending on how you view it? Uh, I was telling Kyle, I had a lot of, I, I was very stressed out the first time I started playing it. Um, but I appreciate the game because because it looks beautiful, and there's you can just tell from uh, from your first like instance of playing how much detail and how much work went into each scenario, each level, because there's so much to do uh, and see. But there's a scene, there's a couple scenes where I just had a tough time with, and and I think it kind of ties into like in our Discord where we were chatting with some people about games that are too close to real life. Mm. And some people don't like to play those kind of games. They want an escape. Like, I know that this game is Androids Androids and it's science fiction, but it has too many parallels for me that are stress-inducing, I think. Gotcha. While I'm enjoying it, I'm simultaneously not, (laughs) which is a weird thing for me. It's interesting. The more I hear about Detroit, the more I think I'm going to love this game. And it's crazy because I haven't given this game a thought at all in the years that we've seen it. I'm just like, nope, didn't like Heavy Rain, ruling it out of my mind. And I think to Seth's dismay, he's constantly like, I'm getting Detroit. I'm like, nope, mm -mm, don't like these (laughs) games. And then I, I, I check out the review cycle. It seems like it's a lot better than, you know, like anything I remember, especially from like a control scheme, at least from what I've seen. I hear Seth talking about it. I hear people on Twitter talking about it. You know, they're starting to say things like life is strange. And I'm like, I like life is strange. These are games I enjoy. And, you know, hearing you like these are like real moral. Del- I like games like this. I, like, I'm starting to that. The FOMO is starting to kick in, as Devin would, would say. And I'm like, ah, I kind of feel like I need to play this game. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think I I don't want to be the person to say yeah your name, but I think if you listen to how how Seth is talking about it, like that's probably, um, and I'm sure Kyle can speak to it a little bit. You probably get better like solid input on pass or play from them. Um, so I jumped into Destiny too because I was like, what do I do? <laughs> so I never finished Osiris. Um, for whatever reason, games came out. So I jumped back in. I finished um, the first expansion today. Um, I'm kind of feeling it again. I have that, like, I'm, it feels comfortable. Um, that whole riding a bike kind of situation, like, I'm enjoying it. Um, so I put in a couple hours here and there the past few days. And then uh, last night, Kyle and I jumped into <clears throat> the Division um, Xbox one x enhanced uh we played for three or four hours last night i want to say stopped at 2 a.m my time yeah right in that ballpark so um i mean we had a blast we had a great time despite uh a few things and one of those things uh, i don't know if we necessarily identified why it's happening or how but at one point when you play co-op you can drop gear you get so another person, your you know, your buddy can pick it up. And I was dropping gear a couple times, and I would drop like let's say a gun, and then all of a sudden I would go into my inventory, and my high level backpack I had equipped was gone. Not only was it gone, it wasn't on the ground; it was just eliminated from the game. So I thought, uh, maybe I didn't have one. And then it happened again with a different equipment, not related to the item I dropped. And then it finally happened to uh, Kyle's, and he lost a gun. I lost a pistol. (laughs) And he didn't even drop anything for me to take. So there's definitely a weird flaw in the game where you're losing equipment. And I told Kyle while we were playing, I said, I don't care right now. It's just green equipment. But if I lose a gold gun or gold equipment, I'm just going to (laughs) quit. So (laughs) uh, I hope that doesn't happen. (laughs) Um, But I think that's it. I... I played Pokemon Quest for three minutes. Oh, just, that's it? But not because I didn't like it, just because it was like midnight and I wanted to show my wife what it looked like. Um, I will play it more because all I really did was pick my starting Pokemon and then do the first series of battles before it jumps into like the start of the game. Um, so uh, it was interesting. You don't, for, for my quick three minute intro, it seems very simplistic, but f- it seems like it would be fun. Um, and for me, a guy who's not into Pokemon just because it wasn't 
like I was a little older when Pokemon came out. It wasn't something I got into. Um, it seems fun and interesting. So I don't know that you necessarily have to be a hardcore Pokemon fan to enjoy it. Um, but who knows? That's just, just the beginning. And I don't know if I'm going to get as in-depth as you might hear in, in a little bit. <laughs> Um, but that's it for me. And I believe we go to Donnie next, correct? Yeah. So let me tell you, I've been playing that Pokemon quest <laughs> way more than I ever anticipated or expected when it was announced. In all honesty, I get it. I get the, I've been getting it in the discord for the last couple of days. Um, and I get it when the game was shown, it was not necessarily a game that anybody expected to want to like, you know, it's, it's not a Pokemon game. Like it's first and foremost, not an RPG. Uh, it's a mobile game and that's like got its own connotations and they talk about it's free to start and that's got its own connotations. Um, I like it. It's good. Um, it's not, like I said, I said in shack last week, it's not the best game. Like I'm not, I'm not here to try and tell anybody it's a great game. I'm not going to like, I don't want to over sensationalize. Um, but it is addictive. I, I do feel like that. And I, I would, I would push back on you a little bit because I think it is addictive because I'm a Pokemon fan. I mean, it is okay. the IP that's driving it. So for example, um, I've been combing the dark web trying to find recipes for my favorite Pokemon. Like so the can... actual dark web or? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm, okay. just, I was like, I'm like, I got a wish list if like Twitter feed hits and getting into like wikis and things I've never heard of. I found a discord just dedicated to Pokemon quest. That's all it does. I mean, and, I was going to uh, say, I know Spice Road sells some interesting things, but I didn't know if they were into selling some <laughs> Pokemon quest stuff nice <laughs> so um yeah i've been trying to do that so i can collect my favorite pokemon so i can then level them up and beat the game um i did buy the stuff so just forthright um the moment i realized i was really enjoying the game was the moment i was like i'm i'm happy to i want i want to buy the stuff it was one of those so it's not microtransactions in the sense of like pokemon go where you just keep buying pokeballs that's not it it has like packs that unlock different tiers in the game so like each pack comes with like a pokemon some decorations for your fort like so uh, like you might get uh, the ability to carry more pokemon or more power blocks or uh the thing that i think is most worthy is that every day you earn tickets and you use these tickets to um to really do anything really right so you use these tickets to to buy stuff um to to expand turns to to make yourself stronger and um when you start the game i think you get 50 a day you totally play this game for free and play it for hours and hours and hours and hours probably beat the game without ever sinking dollar into it if you want to um but for me i want to play it faster you know like i see the grind and the loop that it's taking i'm like no, no i don't want to skip all that and i also want the decorations and i also want the pokemon so i gave him the 30 bucks i started with the 17 dollar pack when I saw how much fun I had with $17 pack, I was like, let me give them the other $13 and let's just unlock all of this now and give me everything that I need. And um, in a lot of ways, I kind of wish they just said it was a $30 Pokemon game. Um, I think maybe that would have changed a lot of people's opinion on on at least giving it a try, at least from my Twitter side. There was even a, a, a point today that I posted a, a recipe guide that I found in the Discord. I was trying to share it. And somebody was like, hey, how did you get this Pokemon? And I was like, it's a part of the pack. And he was like, oh, of course you'd have to buy it. <laughs> it is a video game like somebody programmed the game like <laughs> yeah, yeah you shouldn't be so opposed to parting with your money at all <laughs> and i think when you give it the free to start label that's where people like immediately go it's like well, let me see how much i can play of this game without paying them anything yeah. so now that you've spent the money like mm -hmm. is there can you spend more money or is like no, i'm done 30 bucks that's it that's it i can't i can't do any more i think no hang on if i'm <sighs> It's a good question. I may have to go double check. I think there might be like you might be able you might have the ability to buy ingredients for recipes individually or like in packs of 10, maybe. But I don't see how anybody would ever do that. Like you, you'd be uninformed if you did that. Like I'm collecting ingredients by the droves right now. Like it's it's not hard. So the the collect it's not even a, I'm never I've never been the collect them all Pokemon guy, but I am the collect my favorite Pokemon guy. And that's what's driving me in the game right now. Cause my favorite Pokemon are some of the more rare ones. So I want to find them. I want to level them up and I want to beat the game with them. So 
my entire time I've been playing it so far, I've been playing it with the the guys I got from the packs because they're super OP. And then like the ones that come through every now and again. And then once I discovered this whole meta game, I've literally started all over again. Now I'm just combing through runs so I can get extra ingredients so I can make the recipes so I can get the Pokemon. And when I get the Pokemon, I go all the way back so I can level them back up to where I am. So it's just kind of like this constant loop. The cool thing about the thing that are not cool. I don't know. I, I think some people would actually even hate me saying this. So when you make a recipe, so you don't catch Pokemon. What you do is you battle, you get to go do all your attacks and have fun. And then you gather these ingredients, mushrooms and things like that. You come back, you make a recipe, that recipe attracts a Pokemon to your camp. And then you get to use that Pokemon. That's how you catch Pokemon. Now you have to wait turns. And that's like where the ticket comes in. You have to like each recipe, depending on how good it is, like you have to wait. There's like a the amount of turns you have to wait for you. That, that recipe is done. And maybe two turns, five turns. The most I've seen is six. The game actually does have an autoplay feature. So when you set up your team and your run, so you pick your your Pokemon and there's actually a strategy. Every every level you go to, if you don't realize, there's a wheel that tell you the Pokemon you'll encounter. And if you choose their weaknesses and whatnot, you'll actually gain a bonus level. Because if you go in there and your level is even tied with the level that you're there, I pretty much say you probably have a really good chance at losing um, because the boss in every level is pretty tough. Um, so you pick and match your team and you can go in there and you can just turn on play and it'll automatically auto attack. So it is one of those things that I'm, I'm not here trying to tell you that it's a great video game. I am here to say, or what I've been trying to trumpet it as, and you guys know this about me. It's a perfect game to play while I'm watching a movie. While I'm watching a TV show, while I today I was blogging, I was doing a blog for Momocon and I just had it running next to me. I take a minute, stop, set up a team, do a run, go back to writing. It'd be done. I pick it back up and I do it again. And I just kept doing it. And I just kept doing that. Now I've got like 50 Pokemon. I've got both my Cubones. One of them's about to uh, become Marowak. I've got EVs. Like I've got all this stuff baking and I'm almost back to where I was in terms of like just beating the game. Except now I'm going to be able to beat the game with my favorite team. And I think that's going to make it all that much more rewarding. The extra benefit of buying the packs is that they, uh, anything that you buy is like set to your console. So what that means is my son and daughter who also like the game, who are also playing the game, they didn't have to, we don't have to buy it for them too. Nice. They get everything that I bought. So it's like three of us got everything for thirty dollars, which makes us feel even better. Especially my son. You guys know he's a Pokemon fan. Yeah. So he's to be honest with you, I, I'm sure when my Switch profile updates, people are going to hate to hear this. I guarantee you I'm over 10 or 15 hours in this game. Me, alone. And I guarantee you my son is probably right there with me. He's not probably the love 10, 25 hours into Pokemon Quest this week. If I can tell you how much I play my Marvel game on my phone, it would be embarrassing. <laughs> or, or the Disney game that's on the, the Disney Magic Kingdom game. Like A lot of the gameplay reminds me, like the loop reminds me of Animal, Animal Crossing Pocket Camp. The difference being, instead of picking up fruit, you're battling Pokemon. And yeah. instead of collecting villagers, you're collecting Pokemon. And both of those sound better. Yeah, way better. <laughs> <laughs> to a Pokemon fan, Theo, battling Pokemon is better than picking up fruit and collecting Pokemon is better than collecting villagers. Like, so to me, it's kind of, I could see if I was a suit, if I was really into Animal Crossing, mm-hmm. you know, like Caroline, Chelsea, or even Kevin, I could see how they got in more into that than me. Uh, but this is more themed for me. So anyway, outside of that, outside of the Pokemon quest, I did, um, I did settle in last night with my PlayStation 4 a little bit. Um, because I got the silver case HD Suda 51 game and I went oh. back and started playing that. Those controls are super hard to go back to. Super hard to go back to. If you've never played it, um, yeah, super hard to go back to. It's not even the tank controls, not even the f- start of it. Like you look up with the right trigger, you look down with the with the with R2 button, R1 button, you move like on this grid based realm, but you can look around in all 360 and it's 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 crazy. It's still super fun, it's super mature, and um, you know, the stories are, are crazy. It's all LA noir detective case stuff and just very suda. You know, like you think you're on like a cop case investigating a murder, and all of a sudden a zombie shows up and then there's a ghost, and like it just gets really crazy. <laughs> crazy really fast and then um kyle i did finally play next machina who so did i oh there you go i mean, i forgot about that and oh, it's amazing it's 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 pretty it's pretty incredible i only i don't even know how many levels i played that's that's interesting thing. i didn't i played it for like an hour and i at at some point i got to the point where i kind of felt like i didn't know what i was doing um because there's really no tutorial right 
Nope, not really. It's, and there's a lot of like secrets and hidden ways to do things that you just have to figure out as you play. Okay, because I was feeling that. I was like, I really think I need to look up some stuff on this guy. I was going to actually bring that to you guys because you guys are talking about board games. We'll get into this a little bit, but I'll, I'll just kind of bridge the gap here. That isn't for me. Like the whole... I'm going to discover everything on my own. Like I've never been that person. Like I like to know what's at my disposal. And I I don't mean to say that I need the game to hold my hand, but like the way I play games, if I come across something, I don't feel like I'm 100% aware of what it does, what the strategy of using it and all that is for. Like I'll stop playing and look it up. And like, I started to get that way with next mock. And I was like, I need to like see a guide or something. I need to understand what these, what these gauges are, what these means are like. And I saw the humans and the whole Resogun stuff was great. But then I, you know, I saw some of them, I got lost and some of them are in like in different levels. And I, I, I don't know. I need to know all the details. So I don't the, feel comfortable. The one thing I will say about next Machina that I think is a little different than maybe other games is that, there is it doesn't not give you anything you need to finish the game it's if you care about chasing high scores then you're going to really have to figure out how do i maximize how do i find the secret areas how do i get all the human how do i save all those things that's purely for high score chasing if you're like i just want to finish the game none of that stuff matters for just finishing the game even like the weapons so like i guess my l2 button could use these power ups that I was picking up, but mm-hmm. I saw two or three of them and I couldn't figure out how to switch like back and forth. So I just started like, I was just hitting buttons at one point. Like, I was yeah. Like, once you, you only can carry one. So once you pick one up, it just replaces what you had previously. Gotcha. So I don't know. There are symbols on the screen. I don't know what it means. And like that stuff bothers me. <laughs> like it really <laughs> eats at me. Cause I feel like I'm missing out. You know, I feel like something is something's wrong. I'm going to do something wrong. Right. At least I know. think that's right. I played it, you know, almost a year ago, but I think yeah. that's right. <laughs> it's, it's really good. Beautiful. Um, crazy fun. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, yeah, it's really, really good. Fast fast yeah <laughs> it's i mean it's i mean it is resogun right i mean it's resogun dead nation alien nation it is all of that just in one it's super pretty i love the jump i love the camera painting like that's something we've never had in that space ever before or at least i've never played anything that's done i'm sure somebody's probably done it um, but i've never played anything like that in a twin stick shooter where it took you down took you over the shoulder took you behind took you like looking from the ground up jumping up to different platforms like all of that camera panning um had to take some work and uh that's fun that really messed with my head the first time it went down to like floor level and yeah like, you're like what, what is happening <laughs> yeah awesome all right so I'm glad that you're playing Next Machina finally. If you would have bought it a year ago, maybe, you know, Housemark would still be making these games. But that's fine. I don't blame you at all for that. You need (laughs) 150,000 other (laughs) Donnie's. But I'm glad you're enjoying it now, at least. That's great. Uh, Since you were coming on the show, Donnie, I decided, hey, let's dust off that Switch and let's jump into some things that are that I have been looking forward to on the Switch, which I think are probably a little different than most of the PSVG crew. The things I've been playing, I downloaded and play uh, and got Ikaruga, which is a old school shmup that has been around for quite some time. Again, a game that has like three total buttons that you use the entire time that you're playing it. Pretty simple premise. Uh, you are a ship and your ship can either be white or black. When it is white, it shoots white bullets. It does double damage to black, black enemies and it can absorb white bullets. When you, But you'll be destroyed by black bullets instantly. If you switch it to black... Same thing happens just in reverse. You'll do double damage to white enemies, absorb black bullets, but instantly die when you're hit by a white bullet. And that's it. That's the entire game. And then it's just score chasing, high score chasing. And it's great. I really, really enjoy it. It's still, I had played it a little bit when it first came out, you know, gosh, 20 years ago at this point almost. But I was never, that wasn't the style of game I was really into back then. And in, you know, the last 10 years, I've really fall in love with twin stick shooters and shmups and every, and that genre of gaming and those general genres and Ikaruga is something I'm definitely falling in love with. It's really hard. I'm not good at it at all right now, but it is something that I, I think this is a game I will continue to play in regularly when I dust off my switch kind of like graceful explosion machine. It's a game that's always on there that sometimes I'm like, yeah, this is just what I'm in the mood for and I'm going to play. So if you've never played Ikaruga before and you like that style of game and you like shmups, I think that's a definite pickup. Another game that I got that I was really looking forward to was Just Shapes and Beats. Now, this game, I think this is the game that the title describes what the game is better than probably any game in history, just about. Because literally, you are a square, and there are beats that happen on the screen, 
And all you're trying to do is to avoid those beats. That's it. That's the entire game. You have a little dash mechanic, but you can literally move anywhere on the screen of the Switch. And you're just trying to avoid the beats as they come through. So they're obviously playing to a rhythm of music. So this is something where having your sound cranked on your Switch if you're playing it in handheld mode is important. But music comes in. Sometimes it's going to fade in from the back. Sometimes it's like bullets coming across. And they do it really in really interesting ways. They'll have like enemies that are created that are moving in time with the music. They'll have things fade into the screen. Um, They'll have bullets flying through. So it's really like playing a shmup. But you can't shoot back. All you can do is avoid everything. And if you avoid everything... Then you make it to the end of the level, and that's it. You move on to the next level. The music is excellent. The how they are able to incorporate so many different ways of like bringing the music onto the screen is incredible. It is a really, really good game. I think it's one of those games that is probably going to be too simple to ever like make it on you know a top five or top ten game of the year list. And I'm still pretty early in the game, but if I enjoy it as much as the end that I do now, as I do now. This is a game I might still be talking about at the end of the year. That's how much I like this game. I'm Kyle, really... what does it go for cost-wise? I think it's 15 bucks. Okay. So it might be 20 but I think it's 15 uh, But yeah, so that's just Shapes and Beats on Switch. So again, another game that I really recommend. My only bummer is I don't have a headset that I use with my Switch, so I can't play this in bed because the music is really important. But other than that, that's I'm, if that's my complaint, I don't think it's too bad. And then the one thing I want to talk, I know Donnie has played this... I don't know if Josh has played this as at all. I jumped into the Mario Tennis Aces beta tournament, whatever you want to call it for this weekend. And I both am really impressed and really disappointed all at the same time. I think the game is pretty. It's pretty fun to play, but just, and I know this is a beta and they're just probably just stress testing things. But for me, most of the games I played, the lag was ridiculous. Now, when I was playing later today, earlier today, I should say, it was actually pretty good. I had very, very few leg issues compared to what I did earlier in the weekend. Uh, but earlier in the weekend, I got disconnected like three games in a row where like I would start a game, just completely dis- get disconnected. But I think it was really ha- kind of disheartening that, you know, you're earning experience as you're playing this ter- in these tournaments. And that's the only way to know like how much someone has played. And I would be getting matched up with, you know, I'd have 100 experience and be going against people that have 1,500. And, you know, and if, you're do- if you get a good game, you might earn... 20 or 30 experience for a game so these are people who've played hours of this compared to me who's played like the tutorial of one match so we jump into the game i get i don't even know what's happening i'm getting destroyed so bad i'm like i don't understand how any of this is working and that combined with i think just the precision isn't quite there there were many many times and maybe it was a leg situation where i was like hey i feel like i just nailed the shot perfectly and it would be a body shot and it would hit me or i felt like i was in the right place and it just wasn't quite there so this is still a game that's on my radar. I, I'm interested in it still. I don't know, though, if this is going to be a game that maybe I get play through the campaign and then just get rid of, just because I don't know how much the online component of it is going to be something I'm going to really want to play. I was really looking forward to this game. I'm a big fan of these otter sports games. Like I really like tennis games and I like snowboarding games and things like that. So I was really looking forward to this. And I, don't, I just can't decide. And I, I think I'll probably still check it out. But I wasn't as impressed with this game as I was hoping to. In some ways, I think there's almost too much going on in it. There's too many types of shots. Just a lot, a lot going on in those tournaments. But I guess also for community depth of gameplay, it's probably important. Um, Josh, did you play it in the turn the demo at all? I downloaded it. I don't did it end today? It yeah, I think it ended. I was gonna play it, but um I kind of got caught up in all the chatter on Discord about it. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> Uh, I, it's a game I was really excited for and might still be excited for. I think I didn't play it because I didn't want to be let down, if that makes sense. Um, it's still something I want to get and I want to get it to play with like the PSVG group, like, uh, the campaign, sure, I'll play through, but, um, I was a big fan of like the virtual tennis games mm-hmm. I used to play them with my brother all the time. Um, but I think... If I do get it, I'm going to wait. I'll wait till after the Nintendo online service rolls out because I'm sure just like Xbox Live and PlayStation Network, there's going to be a couple of rough months. Um, and I would love I would love for that to not be right. But uh, maybe this is like a Christmas purchase. Um, once we know if the online community is up and running and if if people I know have the game and are playing it, 
Uh, it would be something I would get, but I don't want to get it just for campaign. Uh, for me, the biggest appeal is the online part. So um, from everything I've been hearing, uh, I think I'm just going to wait a little bit and see where, where it goes and what we're looking at. Donnie, what are your thoughts? I know you played some. You know, it's, it's, it's strange, funny, and probably most democratic when a demo turns people off from a game. It's a weird thing, right? Because it's like they didn't have to do that. And if they didn't do it, maybe more people would buy the game. You know, I, I had this similar experience with Battlefront. Um, I'm kind of in your boat. I was really excited when this game was announced, um, mainly because of the campaign mode. I'm much more of a single player video gamer. So that's like my first, um, that's my first go to. So when they said that was coming back, also like coming off like the Mario Golf hype, you know, like my Mario Golf love really goes back to those old games where they had RPG story campaigns. And then like online was like a thing I just did. I'm agreeing with you in the sense that this arcadey competitive fun thing is not for me. There is a lot of shots and a lot of, like, at one point I was holding the right trigger while moving the left stump thumbstick to the left and double tapping X. And I was like, this is not what I get into tennis games for. Um, I, I find it a little upsetting that they didn't include the motion control scheme in the demo. It's just not there. And so that made me like pay more. Like I went and go dig more detail. Info I haven't been following this game because I, I assume that I know what it is. It's a Mario tennis game, very similar to the Wii U and GameCube versions and Wii versions um, with a campaign mode finally for the long time. So like I feel like I knew what it was. It seems to me from reading about it that the motion control might be its own mode and it oh, may so. not you may not be able to play that way online or only play that way with other people online and it may not have the power shots and trick shots online or in that mode like I, there's a lot of there's a lot of skepticism around that mode even like the IGNs of the world are like we know it's here we've seen it but we weren't allowed to use it because it wasn't in the build like there seems like they're holding that back for some reason and that's just a little concerning because that's kind of the only that's really my only interest my only real interest is we sports with Mario characters like anything above and beyond that I'm kind of not there like I would totally just we sports a uh, campaign up for a while maybe play with my kids and I would play with you guys online but I would be the one flinging my joy con around because I just think that's the fun way to play I'm watching people online and, and obviously this probably just goes to me not being very good because I, I'm watching people play I'm watching the gifts on my Twitter feed and it is insane they're hopping all over the stage I mean it's smash-esque you know, I'm like, how do they do? They're slowing down time and they jump in the air and fireball down to the court. And so it's just not, it's not what I'm into. It's just not what I wanted in the game. It's not what I'm after. So for me, I canceled my pre-order. Not that I'll never get it. I actually think I will. It's just one of those having played the demo and having paid more attention to it. I'm now going, this game probably isn't for me. So I probably shouldn't adopt it day one. I should probably wait. And it might be a Black Friday eShop sale it might be something like that down the road maybe a, a trade-in maybe it comes back down um, there's just other things i think i could be spending my time playing i play that donkey kong you know rabbits dlc uh i was gonna buy just shapes and beats because i have been looking forward to that one quite a while um because my pre-order freed up some money um because i had a gift card and uh i was sitting there at the eShop and i was looking between it and celeste and i voted celeste nice. so i'm gonna play Celeste finally and check that out. So I've got stuff to play. So I, I feel good pushing it off. It makes it easier not to adopt a day one when I see other people in PSVG doing the same, because um, even if I was going to play online, the folks that I would want to play with probably aren't going to be there. So, yeah. And I feel like that the online stability will get there. Obviously. Oh, that'll get better. You know, Mario Kart's good. Right, yeah. Exactly. So I'm not super worried about that. Like I said, I'm sure it's because it was a demo. It just, when you're playing a demo of that style of game and, it, it makes it hard to be like, oh, this was really fun when I had no idea what was happening and what was going on there. So, yeah, we'll see. I don't know. Similar to you, I think I'll get this game eventually. I just don't know when that is going to be. But I'm really glad that the people who are liking it are enjoying it a lot. That's great. The other frustration I had, and this comes down to my regular frustration I talk about on the show, with those, I don't know, the Joy-Cons frustrate me sometimes. There were many times when you have, like, if you flick the, or if you move the right stick, you have, like, this fade move that you can do to, like, get the balls that you could not otherwise get to. And I would do it, and I'm like, that is not the direction I hit at all. And my character was going completely different directions from what I hit. I'm like, that's 
I don't I don't know if it's like I'm flicking it and it's like reading the rebound of that as the direction I wanted to go or what was going on. But I was like, that's not at all right. I, can't, right. I wanted to go, but that's fine. You know, that's just me and Joy Cons. Did you find a different? Did you find it reacting, behaving differently when you used a different controller? I only play. I always play in handheld. So. Oh yeah, you need a pro controller, I guess. Oh, I have I mean, one. But I, I just never use it. <laughs> I am primarily a Joy-Con player at this point, and I primarily play on my TV. And um, we'll see how that goes with Celeste for you. Okay. <laughs> no, I mean I'm I'm open. Yeah, I'm open to I'm open to putting it in. Um, I, I've never that's never been really an issue for me. I, did you ever uh, put like thumb caps or anything on top of your sticks? I haven't. No, and like I said, for most games, it's not a huge deal. It's not mm-hmm. that precise as a control. And like I said. I thought for Celeste, I'm like, maybe I'm just way worse at this game than I think I am. But then other people have been like, no, it's definitely different when you play with a pro, pro controller. So I actually did set it in my dock and actually played on the pro, with my pro controller. And it was definitely different. Noticeable. Like, yeah, it was definitely different. Wow. So. Okay. I'll put that through to test. Yeah. Anyway, hey, that's all the games that we've been playing. But with Donnie here, we said, hey, you know what? Donnie's really been asking to come on the show. He's like, you guys do such a great job. You know, he's building this up. <laughs> And he really wanted to come on the show. And and he recently took a trip to MomoCon. And you may have seen all the awesome work he did there, all the video interviews that have been posted both on the YouTube and on the podcast stream. And while I know he's talked about MomoCon some on the PSVG flagship show, we wanted him to come on here and talk about his board game experience while he was at MomoCon. So, Donnie, talk to us about those board game experiences. Talk to us about MomoCon. What was it like for you venturing out to your first con? Uh, it was great. It was crazy. It was great. We did a MomoCon wrap up for like all of the show floor indie games that I played and kind of my experiences and the folks I got to meet the autographs and kind of just behind the scenes working event as a press. Um, MomoCon was an experience. It was definitely something. The board game par- portion was on the exhibit floor, but really close to the to the competitive gaming scene. Which was interesting because there was always noise. There was always music and stuff going. And I don't know how the board gamers felt about that. And I didn't really, to be honest with you, they didn't really ask. Um, They were really into their stuff. That's why. It's not, you know, I would ask people playing games and stuff their feedback. And, uh, you know, I talked to the developers. I did talk to a couple of board game developers uh, on Josh's behalf. And another one that just caught my attention. And uh, I'll get there in a minute. But uh, the board games are cool. The whole board game checkout place, you know, I tweeted, I tagged you guys in at that. I didn't expect that at all. Uh, is that normal? Is that a common thing? It is now. Um, is that size normal? I mean, it was like a hundred feet of board games. Yeah, like three it depends on, deep. It depends on the convention you go to. Some of the big ones have thousands of games you can check out. And so what, what you said, what you were just saying kind of struck a nerve for me because in a good way, as a memory, when PAX East first started the first year of PAX um, in Boston, their gaming floor was huge, right? And But they still had tabletop games there, but it was the same thing. It was PC games and board games, and it was very, very small. Um, and it did have a place where you could check out board games, and there was probably 100 games you could check out, which is considered small for what is available now. But you were right, you're, you hit it right on the head. It's very. It was very loud. There was a good amount of tables, but nothing compared to what you see now at board game conventions. So it, I'm interested. Maybe MomoCon is going to go the PAX route and expand that in the future. Um, but that kind of reminds me just how like PAX started out with tabletop games in that kind of situation. But um, I'll I'll tweet some pictures or show you some pictures of some of the past recent conventions from last year, they would, they, uh, um, they used this inside of a stadium was full of checkout board game library. That's okay. Yeah. That's crazy. It was insane to see pictures of it. Um, now when I say it was loud, that might be, that might you mean be, for playing board games, like being able to yeah, talk I mean, to when I think about playing a board game, you'd think it'd be quiet, like in, in like in a, like a panel hall or something like that conference yeah. room. Uh, it definitely wasn't that, but what they had is they had a hall. So Momocon exists in two halls of the Congress Center and then the two floors above both of those halls. So it's like panels, game rooms, and then the exhibit floors on the basement. And the exhibit floor rests in two halls. In one hall 
there's the smash tournament the autograph line the food area and board games it's like all tabletop open area and then the there's like a wall and then the next hall it's video games indie games manga comic books that type of stuff all over there um they're in the hall with the with the competition and whatnot but they're on the they're on the opposite sides of the hall so it's not like super loud you just know that stuff's going on over there you know you hear arcade noises when but like if you're sitting at the table you could totally talk to somebody across from me that that yeah. wasn't a problem hearing wasn't a problem it's just i don't know something i noticed i was like i wonder if these people like this um but you know they were way way into it um they had several card tournaments uh i my son and i went and watched pokemon cards and <laughs> Sitting over somebody's shoulder while they're while they're playing a Pokemon tournament in in real time, they they specifically don't like that. <laughs> there's, there's quite a few folks who are like looking at us like, "Would you please go away?" Um, and then there was also a Star Wars card game that we watched. People yes, watched Destiny. Destiny. Yeah. yeah, I'd never even knew something like that existed. And it looked really fun. It looked pretty cool. So we watched that, and uh, that was cool because they had six tables dedicated to each and when i see table i mean like row six rows of tables yeah. so it's probably three or four rows deep probably 50 people a table so in these tournaments they're probably playing at least 100 players at a time in these card games which is crazy now i did like that they had the board game checkout area right next to their food court because that's exactly what my family did like we went and grabbed food got dinner we're sitting there there is a tables of wall of board games just sitting there in front of you while you're eating. And they had somebody walking around like, Hey, do you want to play a board game? You can check any of these out for nothing. You can rent these in the back. Like they had, apparently they had very expensive video uh, board games that you could check out and play, but you had to like give them a deposit. It's like 50 bucks. They wouldn't let you like hold it unless you give them the $50. And then everything else was like, you just handed over your ID, which I thought was interesting because apparently the $50 was like more valuable than your ID. You know, like I was like, this is weird. <laughs> I don't think the $50 instead of my ID, but um, <laughs> that was cool. Some of the games that I did play uh, my first, no, no, my first like working day there. Like when I went there to go do stuff, I went to sit down and eat. I'd been doing interviews, running around. I'd been moving. I just remember I was like, I've got to sit down. My feet are killing me. I grab some rice. I go to sit down and I sit down at a table where these guys are playing suburbia. Mm -hmm. Have you guys played that game? I haven't played it. I know of it though. That looks like a really cool game. Um, I don't know how to play it. Like a, I kind of got it. It's like, it's like city building, right? And everybody like gets these tiles. You get to like plug them on. The thing that I could not keep up with was how it was scored. They had like this other board <laughs> where like sliders were being done. I was like, it's, this is, this is a bit much. <laughs> um, and that really kind of gives me a lot of insight and awareness of just like how crazy some of these board games get. And there's like a little bit of desire for me to try something that's like so in depth, not, I saw some things that were like just way, I was like, no, never, no. Um, but something like that seemed kind of cool. Like I would love, it's like I played like Risk and Axis of Allies and stuff when I was little, you know, I had access to some board games like that. I would love to play those with my family. I just think the whole, you know, global domination aspect has no appeal to my wife or my kids, but I would love right. to get into something that, you know, we could play, an entire week of, you know, like seven, 10 days going, like we could have a board set up and just always be playing and kind of come and go. Something like that has an appeal to me that I think would kind of create some memories for us. Um, so outside of that, you know, we played those, we played the giant Jenga games. Um, but uh, so I want to talk about really, I guess I've got two or three games I want to talk to you guys about. Um, one of them is zero inbox. The other one is gravity warfare. The other one is uh, anchor kingdom of the gods. Yeah. And uh, so I'll, I'll talk about let's talk about zero inbox first, if you don't mind. Yes, let's do it. <laughs> zero inbox caught my attention almost instantly as soon as I came across it. Um, two lovely people who I already forget their names, uh, but they're all over our Twitter. We tweeted them all that uh, two lovely people sitting at a booth and they were in the indie game showcase. So I'm playing these games. I just keep coming across it. And there weren't a whole lot of board games kind of in this area. So they're very, you know, it was like the, a lot of eye candy. Um, they have a game. It's called Zero Inbox. It's not out yet. It's like in beta production. One of them. Basically, they have a test demo for what they want it to be. And uh, you can help them. You can sign up and you can beta it and you can download the materials and play it and give them feedback. They are very open to it. And I get to talk to them. What caught my appeal of this game is it's it's got a style. 
it's got a Google style that like is just apparent and it's very colorful. And I just remember seeing it. And I was like, that I don't know what that is, but that's really cool. It looks cool. And um, yeah, Josh passes me, Lena, yeah. Lena and um the other guy she's with. <laughs> um there and I've got an interview for them. Sadly, all the interviews that we pulled from the show floor, um, just the, the audio is just not it's not very good. Like it's you know, it's really loud and whatnot. So to fix it all up, it makes it sound really robot-y. Um, we've got our best working on it. I don't know if we'll get to use them. Uh, I think it's Lena and Josh, if I, if I can recall. I think his name's Josh. So anyway, what's more important is the game. So I'm walking by, I'm playing these indie, indie games, and I, I run by. I remember on the first day I run by, and I'm like, that's really cool. We have a board game show. I want to come talk to you. And they're like, great. And I'm like, I'm busy right now, but I'm going to come back. And then like the next day I came they're like, you got to come play. And I was like, I, I got to get there. I got an 11 o'clock. I'll, I'll be back. And then I run back by. I'm like, I got two o'clock. I'll be back. So it was like this constant, like back and forth with us over two days where I was like, I got to come play this game. I got to come play this game. Finally, I came to sit down with this game and this game. All right. Here's the elevator pitch for zero inbox. It's totally a board game about email, <laughs> which sounds terrible. <laughs> Right. And uh, but when you see it, it kind of makes sense. So it's it's all kind of like this off office space esque mockumentary on working a day job. And um, what, what do you do is you, you travel this monopoly like board like around and your goal is to get rid of your of your emails to clear your inbox, like to get away for the weekend. And the cards that you pick up along the way, as you land on spaces, you roll dice and you move, you land on spaces, you draw a card and you do things. Um, the cards are just ridiculous. So they're, and they're all from like these stories that these two have heard, you know, through friends, through family about email catastrophes. Like one guy that they were telling me the story, one guy was actually CC'd on an internal memo to fire him. <laughs> so you read the email and it's like, Hey, am I supposed to be on this email? And like the boss replies, like you are going to know sooner or later. So I guess this is a best, like, so, you know, so there's funny quips and jokes along the way. And that's like what they're working on, right? They're working on that and they're working on images and like symbology and stuff like that. But the idea of the game is that you get four adults around maybe with an alcoholic beverage or two, and you laugh and swap stories about these dumb emails that happen at work. And you get these action cards, like you can crash the servers and uh, you can reply all and like start passing off your messages to other players in the game. And it's just like this funny play on words about just how monotonous and awful email can be at times. And uh, it was neat. It didn't take that long to play. So about 20 minutes, uh, I started to get the hang of it on my first playthrough. I still don't understand how the game ends all that well. And, you know, they were telling me like they're working on their instructions so far. Their instructions are only two pages deep. And that's like their thing. They don't have any imagery on their cards. It's all text based. So they want to get that to more like pictures and stuff. But they're still, like I said, they said it's beta. This is basically yeah. just an idea. It's just mm -hmm. an idea of what they've got. And they want to see if it's worth something. I think it is. Um, I got the concept. I guess that's probably the most important part, right? This game's not out. So I sat down in five minutes. I got it. I was like, this is a neat idea. Yeah. You guys have something here. If you can put it into something that's polished, people, will, I would buy that game. I would buy it because it'd be funny. It's great that they're doing it this way. Um, at PAX, at least there's a thing called Unpub, and it's for unpublished developers to sit in a room and play their game with not just um, people like us, but they specifically have times allotted to them in this conference room where like develop like people who work for Asmodee and Z-Man can come in and also talk to these guys about developing a game for them, even if like everything isn't ironed out yet. Yeah. So even to hear that much is awesome because they it sounds like they have a clear um path on where they want to go and and letting people like you play it and tell them what you like and think could be improved is, I think that's great. I it sounds like an awesome game. My first reaction was, because <laughs> I hear this almost weekly, I was like, my wife's a paralegal and she's got stories for you guys. Like, we've got to get you <laughs> two together. We'll strike some names, we'll redact some stuff, but she's got some of the best email stories possible. And I nice. think if they... I do think if they took it just a little bit more like adult humorish, if they just added a little bit more maturity to it, I think it, I think it could like really ratchet up and get them, get them. I was, I was telling about it because right now it's still very like office, um, office professional. Yeah. Right. And I was thinking like, it'd be cool if you like threw some spam in here 
you know, like somebody <laughs> signed up for the wrong thing. Like you could really have yeah. some fun with it. Right. I was like, that would be great. You know, like employees, so-and-so has got something being delivered to his email and something like that could really spice it. Just give it a little bit of kick. Um, well, that's what they do. They get that target branding, do the, like the after dark version yes. as well. So they call it like the spam version or something like that. Yeah. you That's nail on the head. Yeah, so I, that was my immediate thought, but uh, it was pretty cool. Like, so you you beat the game by getting rid of all of your cards, <laughs> but I still don't understand how he did it. <laughs> that is the thing. Like, even when the game ended, I was like, and walk me through that again. So, like, he had he had nothing but action cards, but he went around like the first time go, so he didn't have any emails in his hand, but he had cards in his hand, and I just didn't feel like I knew. And they didn't give me like an instruction really tutorial, so maybe it's just on me. But like that was the thing. I still had like some confusion because I just kind of thought when you say get rid of all of the emails, I'm looking around the board planning for everybody to like if you have a card, you have an email. Right. You gotcha. see, like I was like, if you've got like I'm thinking get rid of all your cards. Right. It may not necessarily be you could have action cards that aren't. That's emails. like the bluffing aspect of it. Yeah. And uh, I just don't think I got that part of it because I was holding on to like emails to like play them with action cards later, thinking that other people had emails. Yeah. So it's just like, maybe if I played it five times, maybe I would go away. But outside of that weird, my only personal take on it, it was a really enjoyable experience. They were really cool, like super friendly. They were telling me about Twin Cop and all these other, like the people around them that they were playing. I saw them playing games with people at all hours of the day over the, over the weekend. I mean, really, they just kept going. They just kept playing round after round. I watched two people play the game and they were telling me they had this great story where they had a girl come through and just crush them in a way that they never expected. So they have like action cards where you can forward emails to other people. You can server crash and get rid of cards. You can like send cards to like spam and whatnot. And apparently she makes her, made her way around the board. And right before she ended, she just played like eight cards, like on one turn and just bam, 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 bam. And got rid of everything. And they were like, nice. We never accounted for anything like that, and it just kind of blew their minds. And that was a that was a cool story. Awesome. That's why you play test. That's right. <laughs> Definitely. Um, the other game that I got a pretty good demo on was Anchor. Have you guys ever heard of this? Anchor Kingdom of the Gods. Is it A N K E R? Yeah, A N K U R. A N K U R. It sounds familiar, but, but um, is it a Kickstarter project or was it? Do you know? That I don't know. What I, the reason I went to their booth that I thought it would be cool for you guys to know was, one, they had a really awesome setup, like an elaborate, like a cool looking table. But two, they were up for like eight awards, very like all these professional awards that I never heard of. But maybe you guys, I don't, I don't know them now, but like all of these game awards and like all these different shows and all these different stuff, like a national thing. So apparently they were a pretty big deal. And it's a tabletop role playing game which I've never really seen anything of. Like I've never seen anybody play games like this before. And it's got castles and it's got figurines and it's got like structures they play. It's got all this stuff on top of the table. And I was like, it's really cool. And I was tracking with the guy until he gave me the rule book, which looked like the uh, collector's edition art guide for God of War. I mean, it was yeah. legit two <laughs> inches thick with all this artwork and all this mythos and all these rules. And like, and that was the rule book. Yeah. Yeah. And I was just like, there's no way. There's no way I can even. And he's telling me, like, there's like you pick like a race and then there's like job system. And it was like Skyrim on a board game. And that was really like kind of my only relation that I could have with it. It just blew my mind. Is like, how do you how do people play games like this? Like, <laughs> I mean, it just seemed yeah. like it would never end. <laughs> you know, it's like a, it's like a different life or something like that. It's crazy. Um, yeah, and then the lot. I'm sorry. They're from. He's from. Uh, they're from Georgia. Them. Yes. They're, yeah, they. They had a successful Kickstarter, um, two years ago. Um, Chris Miller, um, from Atlanta. And yeah, basically, like, these games aren't meant to end. You know, they're like Dungeons and Dragons. Like, they just meant to keep expanding books, and you play these games forever. You know, it's funny because I mentioned I was like, oh, so it's like Dungeons and Dragons, and you could tell that like maybe that that, that rubbed him the wrong way. They don't like it. Yeah. He was like. <laughs> he was like. Yeah, if it was simple. <laughs> it's like, excuse me. Uh, the last game that I checked out was called Gravity Warf Warfare, which yeah. Josh had sent me to go look at. And it was funny because you sent me um, 
I took a picture of a cosplayer cosplaying as 2B and just behind her just happened to be this Gravity Warfare poster. So Josh comments and I go to look at it thinking it's totally going to be about 2B's outfit. And he's like, you've got to go see this board game in the background. I'm like, what? Where? <laughs> I had to have him direct me back to the photo because like, where was the game at? <laughs> um, and when I found them, they actually weren't there for like a day. Aww. So I didn't know if it was just like an advertisement. Yeah. And then uh, one day I went to go walk past and they, they were setting up. And nice. it was a guy and his wife. And for love of me, I should have found his name because I have an interview for him. Dan. His name is Dan, I think. And um, he is the, the guy that created the game. And he was there with his wife. And uh, she was kind of like working the booth. He was playing the game. She was the one telling everybody about it, handing out pamphlets. Right. She, was, she was doing the work. <laughs> so I, I walked by the booth. I was like, hey, I want to talk to somebody about the game. She's like, absolutely. She goes, Dan, get over here. Stop playing the game. You know, so it was like, <laughs> that was a cool thing. They were very friendly very friendly, nice folks. Um, uh, they wanted, I, you know, at the time I thought my audio was great, but like they wanted to set something up after hours. Like we'll get out of here. We'll do it somewhere quiet. And I was like, nah, we're, we're good. Um, Josh, I don't know anything about this game. They, they, they told me how it works twice and I still don't get it. That, that game blew my mind. It blew my son's mind. All right. There, it's a card game, but there's like gemstones and then there's like, figures and then there's a board but the board is suspended in air and it spins yeah. and people are putting pieces on the board as it spins and i'm just like i'm too dumb for this game like this game is crazy it's nuts i'm glad you checked it out i i, I was a backer of it on kickstarter and they kind of just pulled the rug out from underneath everyone and they were like we're canceling it and we're going to come back bigger and better so that we can have six players and we can do And like, that's like unheard of on Kickstarter. People don't do that. Turn just, away. A lot of people just go for the money, which is fine because sure. they want to get their game out. Yeah. But these guys were like, we talked to a lot of people. We want to make this more accessible. But just the images of this game alone, I've never seen a board game or any game like yes. it ever. I've never seen so anything like it either. I was immediately drawn to it. It has a significant eye appeal. And I can tell you, they were near the autograph booth, kind of away from the board games. And there were several times I came by to get my interview and I couldn't because they were, they were busy. They were nice. always playing. They always had people at their booth. And like, I think it has a lot to do with the way that the game looks. When you see it, when you see them in mid game, you're just like, what the hell are they doing over there? Like you can't, you can't help but see it because it's nuts when you see it move in real time. It's a crazy style. Now I will tell you they have that independent spirit. I asked them about the Kickstarter thing and I asked them about being uh, seeking a publisher, both questions you gave me. And he, he automatically, he said kind of to both of them, he's like, we want to make the game that we want to make and we want it to be awesome. We want people to see it. And we didn't feel like we were ready. And now we do. Nice. And um, it was a really good story. Apparently his dad came up with this game idea and they had played it back when they were kids. It's been like a family game for years. Yeah. And it just dawned on him like 10 years of playing this game. He was like, Man, other people will probably like this. And like the, re the resurgence of, of board gaming, you know, I guess like yeah. proper, you know, he was like, people could be into this. And uh, he was showing like uh, pictures and describing like early demos of like what his dad made out of like cardboard and stuff. I was like, this is a neat story. Um, I don't know. I still don't know how to play it. I still don't know exactly how it was how what what it takes to win, but it's that is a crazy crazy game. But uh, cool people, so awesome. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, it's very very rare because when that game went on Kickstarter, I am not somebody who usually backs a Kickstarter right away. I usually put the like, hey, remind me when this is, when there's 48 hours left in this, and then I'll look where my finances are and make the decision then. So I had done that for that game because I'm like, this just looks so cool, and then all of a sudden it was canceled. And I was like, oh, maybe they just did like maybe they got no money, maybe nothing. And then I saw that they had raised like, you know, more than double what they were asking for, but canceled it anyway. And I was like, oh, man, that's interesting. So I'm really I think June 20th <laughs> is when the next one starts. Yes, it's this month. I just don't remember the date. Yeah, I think it's June 20th is when they're coming back to Kickstarter with their new and bigger project. So we'll see how that goes for them. Anything else about Momocon you want to talk about, sir? Not unless you guys have specific questions you want to ask. Not especially not from the board gaming front. From the board gaming front, that's about everything I could get. So I, I wanted to ask you. Um, I think it was talked about in the Discord, but not necessarily for at least our listeners. Um, for me, like my first time going to a convention was it was PAX East 2012. 
Um, it was overwhelming to the extent of exhaustion on the third day. Um, and, it, and I didn't necessarily know if I wanted to go back, but I did. Um, but now, like with PAX Unplugged, I found a convention that kind of just has what I really want to focus on. So I want to ask you, um, what, how was, what did you experience um, as your first con? And would you go back to one like it? Or would you want to find a specific type of con? Or are you kind of like, con's not my thing? Um, we talk a little bit about this in our MomoCon wrap-up, but this is kind of from a different angle. Um, working an event like as, as a press member, or at least the, my take on working an event as a press member, I don't know if I'd want to do it again because I tried to do a lot and I was always on the move. And there was a part of me feels like I just didn't have a lot of fun. I had some awesome moments. Don't get me wrong. I got to meet Studio 51. It's a yeah. lifetime thing for me. I had to interview Troy Nolan. At least got to, like, I didn't get to meet them. I had to take a picture with them as they were kind of making their way out. Um, that stuff was awesome. But and it was a lot of work in between there and trying to do all the things. And I, you know, I got 10 interviews from the show floor. I played every one of the indie game showcases, um, and interviewed 10 of the guests that were there. And I only got to take like a panel. And it was funny because I, I wanted to take like 10 panels and I wanted right. to play like 50 games and I wanted to see the smash tournament. There's like all this stuff I wanted to do. I didn't get to do. And I just attributed it to trying, you know, I had somewhere to be, <laughs> I had somewhere to be almost every hour of the day. I had something to go do. So there was a lot of that. Um, and that's not bad. It's just, you know, I think with Momocon, video games are such a small part of Momocon, really. I mean, it's kind of the smallest part of Momocon. The video games are, I don't know, everything else is bigger. Cosplay is bigger. Panels are bigger. Um, the competition gaming is bigger. The comic book section is bigger. Apparel is bigger. Like everything is bigger than the gaming space. The gaming space, probably like 13 booths, you okay. know in this entire hall, <laughs> you know, like two halls in this entire two halls. Now they've got all these gaming related things like panels and whatnot on the sides. But like, if you were there to play games that were there, like on a show floor to try stuff out and stuff, it's super small. So I could see going back to Momocon year over year, kind of feeling like diminishing returns, especially if you have people, because, you know, there were a lot of people that are like, we were at Momocon last year and there are already a lot of people that have already committed to come back next year. So I could see something like that. Um, I definitely think cons would be fun. I, I get that exhaustion feel that might've just been with me trying to do everything I was doing. Um, but also like everything that we did. So we dropped kind of what I would call like, we dropped like a major interview every day of the week. Then we did a, a wrap up podcast and I had all the pictures and all the tweets and the blog story. And I got all of that out in five days. Yeah. So it was like, I did Momocon. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, came home Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, dropped a story, dropped a blog, dropped a podcast, and did all of it in a row. There's a part of me that's just like, I just want to play video games again. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, at some point, I want to get back to playing video games again and have fun and uh, not trying to do all this because, you know, you feel like if you don't, if you don't get it out, you know, you'll get beat or somebody else will get it out and nobody will ever care about your coverage or anything like that. So, yeah. so there's like a rush, but I mean, I think it's a hard question for me to answer holistically because I haven't been to other cons. I can imagine if I went to like E3 or Gamescom, I'd be like right at home because it's all my wheelhouse, right? I sit there on the show floor and just play games for hours and hours and hours and have a blast. Um, and this isn't that. And uh, I, I got to see things like board games and like Gravity Warfare, like Zero Inbox that I never would have seen or paid attention to if I'd went to another event. There are several, like I, I bought comic books for the first time in my entire life. <laughs> I've never bought a comic book before. I got to see some stuff like that. Um, cool little exhibit stuff. But um, yeah, uh, I definitely don't know if I'd want to work the event again. Um, definitely not in the same way. Maybe a much smaller role or maybe splitting it up amongst other people stuff like that so you still you still get you still get to go to your first con at some point as a person as a, that as a guest right. yeah okay because that was a funny thing because i bought a ticket to go i was just gonna go <laughs> i was just going one day with my kids and kevin was like no 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 we're gonna blow this all up we'll send you there we'll get you a press badge you do, do all this work and i was like uh okay <laughs> yeah so yeah i still yeah Yes, I still kind of feel like I didn't experience my first con. Like even the lines, like I bypassed the lines. I didn't, and I I, I did that like illegally. I just, you know, I have, um, 
I work for the building when they have special events uh, on the public safety side. So I have a badge to get me to all the stairwells and everything <laughs> I need to. And I've got friends and stuff. So, you know, I didn't wait in lines. I didn't do any of the hard, like this hard stuff. I didn't go through any of that. Nice. No, I was good. I get in and out, do whatever I want to go, go wherever I want to go. So, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't real con life. <laughs> Awesome. Well, hey, as we wrap up this supersized episode of Board with Video Games, we do have a few listener questions that are specific to Donnie. So we do <laughs> want to cover these before we leave today. So first we have from Kevin Austin. If Donnie played board games, would he only get like one playthrough and then trade it in? <laughs> Is that how that would work, Donnie? If you bought board games, would you just get rid of them Did after one play? <laughs> you can do a math trade. You could do, you know, you could you possibly sell them? trade them with no, I bought um, One Night Ultimate Werewolf, and we still played that. You know, we tried to break that out at the family get-together, and the family wasn't really feeling it. Gotcha. I don't know. I think, it's a challenge with board games. And yeah, yeah, I think we missed the mark on because we, we the family, think it's great. Like, my kids and I, we play it with, with my wife, and we think it's great. We tried playing it with the grandparents, and they weren't really feeling it. So we kind of so missed the mark have, on that one. He does have a serious question, though. And he says, but seriously, what types of board games does he enjoy? Mm. And then based on his response, he wants us to give you other suggestions. So when you're playing board games, Donnie, what board games do you enjoy? Mm. So I don't I don't have a whole lot of experience, you know, like I still I, I own Catan. I got it for my birthday. So I haven't played it. Uh, it just sits there in the box. At some point, I got to make time to play it. You know, I, I play card games quite a bit with my kids. We're, we're big Pokemon fans. So we've got, I don't know, 18, 20 decks and booster packs and boxes and stuff around the house. My son and I really enjoy it. It's really kind of a me and him thing. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a part of One Night Ultimate World that I really enjoy. I think like the whole bluffing, lying to everybody, that overcooked like type thing about the game is fun to do with family. So I think I'd be into anything that kind of resembles that. Um, I definitely get the sense that there are some board games that are they're hard to track on. You know, like just are hard to keep up with. And I think anything like that is an immediate no go. Like if you've got to seriously reference the board, like the instructions while you play, um, we're probably not going to enjoy. And like, honestly, the first time we played Mario Level Up, we were like, what? What are we doing? Like, why? And like, do we roll dice? Like, how do we had so many questions? Um, so, like, I think something simple, which kind of makes it hard. You know, I said earlier, like, I think I'd be interested if somebody was like, check out this board game where you get to, I don't know, put these figures on a table and like make them battle or do something and have these castles or structures that the setup I think is intriguing. Like, there's a part of that intrigues me. I'm like, man, I would love to just like put a bunch of money into something like that and set it up all over like the dining room table and have the entire family playing. It'd be really cool, but it would also have to be like easy to get into and easy to explain, you know, it'd have to be like pretty simple, something I could convey in, you know, five minutes or less at worst five minutes or less. Otherwise everybody just kind of loses interest. So hmm. I don't know with that said, I mean, what do you guys think are, are up my alley? I have two recommendations right off the bat <laughs> and you already hinted at one. You talked about it earlier when Ashley and I went to PAX Unplugged, we signed up for um, a teach learn, a teach and play, which they did a bunch of, but we did Star Wars destiny. And it was 15 bucks. They gave us a starter pack, which is $20 normally. And they taught us how to play. Um, if you're already playing Pokemon and it's something mm-hmm. that maybe your son will get into or even your daughter, um, it's not too different from the Pokemon game Okay. Um, as far as me- uh, mechanisms go. But it also adds dice collection, which can be fun if you're into the, the collection thing. Yeah. And you have all these characters and... When you play the game, you have a certain amount of um, points that you can assign to heroes and you, you, each hero has a cost. So you could play, like you could pick, like, I'm just going to be a Palpatine and a stormtrooper, and that's your full cost. And if you add more dice to the character, it it increases their cost. Or you could be like, I'm going to have six main characters, Finn, Ray, Yoda, depending on their costs. And then you play in a, you pick a battlefield from like, the movies you can also use tie fighters and you can use lightsabers and it's all based on die rolls and the cards have effects based on the die you the dice you roll super cool super fun easy to learn so like you could learn it and then easily teach it in that five minute like window that like hits that um and then to talk about bluffing the game that immediately came to mind i don't know if kyle's already thinking of it is sheriff of nottingham 
um, which is an awesome Robin Hood style game, but you're playing the sheriff and people are trying to sneak contraband past you in these little baggies. And you'd be like, I'm going to, I put in an apple and a turkey into this bag and you can choose to tax them and search their bag and they could be sneaking contraband in there like gold or whatever and okay, the point of the game as you're talking I, i'm i'm amazoning i oh, have yeah. arcane wonder sheriff of nottingham mm-hmm. and i've got playmat board games it's 14.94 merry men board games is 20 dollars, and then just sheriff of nottingham 3403 are they all the same thing are they, they have no, different those versions are all different so mm. if you're amazoning it and you want to find sheriff of nottingham i can tell you who makes it um, okay. arcane wonders isn't it it's all of these yeah. arcane wonders so okay so the one you see the merry men that's an expansion okay so the one the base one is the 34 dollar one but you gotcha. you can find it for cheaper than 34 dollars. okay amazon isn't uh while we're on amazon um they're not super competitive board game wise Ooh, uh they do know. have they do have good sales every once in a while um, but Sheriff of Nottingham is twenty four dollars on miniature market, and that's what you can expect to pay twenty four twenty five bucks. Okay. Um, very fun. It can be fun for the family to play because everyone gets to be the sheriff while you're playing the game. It passes on to players, so one person isn't just dominating the. I'm going to see if you're lying or not. And there's. There's downsides. If you want to inspect someone's goods and they don't have contraband, the sheriff gets penalized. So there's reasons to not do it as well. And you have to declare what you're doing. So it also is like reading people's poker faces. It's a very fun game. It is great. That was the one I was thinking of for okay. sure. It is excellent. So one other question from super listener Splig. Which is a very funny question. This is, how does Donnie <laughs> feel about Nintendo following board game trends and making people pay extra for pieces of cardboard? Hey, man, you got to go where the money's at, right? If you got all these people out here on Kickstarter throwing thousands of dollars at cardboard games, got to get in on that racket. Got to cut you out a slice of that market. That's right. So I haven't listened to the Nintendo Shack E3 preview preview or predictions episode but what i want to know is do you think there will be a another labo presented at e3 i made a prediction that whatever this yoshi game is comes with a labo amiibo accessory toy something or another because it's all cardboard paper based and whatnot right and i was thinking something smaller you know, like the accessory kit or something that like you can like works with a joy con or you can scan it as an amiibo like i was thinking like maybe you build like a cardboard yoshi or something like that um but that was kind of something i was thinking could be built into it but uh i don't know i don't know how well labo is selling you know i, th- I don't think it's like setting the world on fire sales wise i think it moved units um i also don't think that that's necessarily a take on the game's impact to the market like i know for me i was never going to buy the thing in april to me, that was 100% Christmas presents, Black Like I, The moment I saw it, I was like, yep, totally going to buy that down the road when I can put it under the Christmas tree. Like, it's a perfect Christmas gift. Um, so I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. I hope so. I think it's neat. It's a neat concept. Uh, they just got to find a way to, to find its space. You know, they got to give it a, a utility that makes sense. Absolutely. Like VR, you know, they got to they gotta find a way to, once they implement Mario into Labo and Zelda into Labo, then it'll start to start to go. Did you, did you see the, the latest uh, PlayStation E3 supposed leaks? Mm-mm, no. Uh, Bioshock VR. <laughs> that sounds about right. Yeah, that was the, that. that was the most recent leak. We'll see if that happens or not. So, okay. but hey, this has been a gangbuster of a show. Josh, yes. I think we should wrap this up. I think it is that time. Um, Before we do our normal wrap-up, we want to make sure everyone knows, uh, not even next week, it's Sunday today we're recording. You guys will get this on Thursday. Um, But a week from today, we're in full court press E3 mode. PSVG, you're going to see so much coming out of PSVG. Uh, So Board of the Video Games is going to be taking a break next week. so this might be your time to send in that fan fiction. Kyle is dying to get. Um, so take that Thursday time period you listen to us and just uh, type something up and uh, shoot it our way. 
But make sure you're listening. We're going to have so much content. Um, Donnie and I are going to be, I think it's Donnie and I, will be live streaming the Xbox two-hour, maybe, press conference. Um, that should be exciting. And then I think we start with Xbox and we don't stop until E3 is over. Uh, conference after conference after recap show. Uh, if you listened to PSVG last year, you know we take this very seriously. Um, everyone puts their best foot forward and we give you the best effort we can. So uh, maybe I'll sneak in a couple of board game references. Who knows? Uh, but we'll see. Uh, otherwise, uh, you guys know the drill. Um, thank you for joining us on this uh, weird, wonderful board game, video game adventure. Um, I want to thank Donnie. Um, just like Kevin, Donnie has been a huge, huge, huge support uh, beacon for us. He's been promoting us, and you, I, I mean, you guys are. He goes to conventions that happen to have board games at it, and he ends up getting us interviews and talking to people, and and even gets to play some himself. So, by the um, way, you know, Lena, um, her companion, Dan, they all said they'd be happy to come on your guys' podcast. Just reach yeah. out to them, let them know you, you want to get them. On. Yeah, they they'd be happy to. Yeah, we will certainly do that. Um, because. Uh, if we're not, we're part of the indie podcast group. We want those indie board game groups on here too. This is where people start from. Um, so I'm excited, but thank you. Uh, honestly, um, I know that we gave you a hard time because we didn't have you on right away and <laughs> vice versa. Um, but I think this was the perfect time to get you on, uh, kind of get you into that. Uh, I know you do play Pokemon and you play some board games, but um, we're hoping via us and our fans that we get some more board game talk and have you back on uh, down down the line in the future. Maybe you're on PAX Unplugged time. But I'm not going to – I'll skip my plugs. You guys know where to find me. You can find us on Board with Video Games. That's B-O-A-R-D with V-G at gmail.com <laughs> or on Twitter <laughs> or on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not trying to scare anybody, but we did get another um, submission for our Dice Tower contest. I'm not telling you how many we have, but it's still open. You guys get, I wouldn't say plenty of time, but you have some time. Um, it's open to anyone who listens to this podcast. So please send in your predictions for the Dice Tower Board Game Awards, and you could win a board game. How sweet is that? You can, You could win... Who knows what I'm going to send you? Some dirty socks, uh, a used copy of Machi Koro. Who knows? <laughs> but there'll be at least one new board game in there. <laughs> uh, that being said, Donnie, uh, tell all of our listeners where they can find you. I think I'm going to buy the Star Wars game, by the way. Yeah, good. <laughs> um, you find oh, me on Twitter. Target, Target before you go, Target has the two-player Starter set half off right now, fifteen bucks for two player. Amazon's getting at twenty. Okay. Yeah, so check it out. <laughs> um, you can find me on Twitter at Play Nintendo, and you can follow all of us over there at PSVG and the blog PSVG dot blog. I know a lot of folks don't ever come to our website, but all of our interviews are there. I just did this big Momocon wrap up show with Kevin. And I hope you all listen to it. I really do because the amount of people that confused Suda Fifty One with Wario Sixty Four I thought was concerning. <laughs> And uh, it was very concerning. I had at least 10 people ask me what, what it was like to meet Wario 64 when I posted <laughs> those pictures. So in that interview or in that Momocon wrap up, uh, probably one of my favorite pieces of audio that I think we've done at PSVG. Kevin and I just spent 20 minutes talking about Suda 51. And I tell you like how I got to know him, like through my cousins who were like way into Japanese stuff and, you know, playing No More Heroes and Chainsaw, or Chainsaw Lollipop and thinking there Lollipop Chainsaw and all that type of stuff. Um, you know, silver case and uh, just all of what it was like to meet him. I got this great story when he autographed my switch case that I think uh, should put a smile on any video gamers uh, face. So definitely go listen to it. It's about midway through the episode. So, but the whole episode is definitely worth the will listen. It is. I was thinking that earlier. Cause I was like, man, I should probably should put this in front. Cause you got to listen to me just talk about all of the indie games leading up to that point, which I know some people just may not want to hear me talk about twin cop. <laughs> so, <laughs> I've heard great things about Twin Cop actually. That's uh, an interesting game, man. That's, uh, <laughs> that's something that'll, that'll stick with you. 
Awesome. Well, hey, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, PlayStation Network, Xbox Live, and Board Game Geek, all at Psychocross, C Y C O C R O S S. Again, please don't miss us too much next year's E3. As always, if you have suggestions for future topics, reach out to us on the social medias. And remember, everyone, whether it be board games or video games, never stop gaming. has been a production of the Play Some Video Games Podcast Network. Find more great content at PlaySomeVideoGames.com.